Father, we thank you for this day. We're asking that whatever it will take, whatever we'll need from you, to make us acceptable to the point you'll be able to depend upon us, you'll grant to us from this day in Jesus' name. Amen. We know there is much in your vineyard to do, but you are looking for people you can depend upon. And we pray that you will help us to be serious with our Christian lives so that at all times we will have what it takes for you to depend on us. In Jesus' name we pray. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 11, From verse 19, we want to study about missions and missionaries. As revealed from the pattern of life of the people of God in the early church. We're all familiar with Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1, verse 8, that the church is supposed to be an evangelistic church, a missionary church, not only concerned with the internal activities of the church, but seriously concerned with the outward activities the church ought to have towards the world. In Acts chapter 1 verse 8, it says, But he shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And when that Holy Ghost comes, he'll make evangelists, soul winners, or missionaries out of all who have got the Holy Ghost. He came down from heaven to earth and he sends the people he feels from the place they were before to other places where the need is. And it says, after that Holy Ghost has come, ye shall be witnesses unto me. Ye shall be witnesses unto me. All those people that receive the Holy Ghost are actually witnesses. Some of those witnesses are soul winners. Some of them are evangelists. Some of them are missionaries. All of them have to carry the word of God to regions beyond, to people beyond, to hearts beyond. And he will be witnesses unto him both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And we begin to have a feel of the missionary thrust and evangelistic outreach as we come to read in Acts 11 from verse 19. These preachers and pioneers were those who were dispersed from Jerusalem by persecution. Yet in God's providence, because of his sovereignty, everywhere they went, they took the word of life. The enemies of the gospel intended to scatter the church, destroy the church, but then Christ made use of the scattering and he multiplied the church. Those scattered and despised places where the Gentiles were, we see the way they first of all carried out the message, the word. And today we see that it's so much the same. But as those who are sent out yield to the Holy Ghost more and more, much is done in the spreading of the gospel. As we look at the verses before us, we'll see the genesis of missions. Genesis means beginning. So we'll be looking at the genesis or the beginning of missions, then the gifts of missionaries, and then the generosity of members. In Acts 19, uh, 11 verse 19, Now they that were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen, traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only. Persecution arose in the early church. 
against the early church and if it affected the early church physically they suffered it affected them socially they were displaced and, dis and uh, dispersed it affected them spiritually because they were moved away from the central church the headquarters church where they were it affected them in their families in their communities because many of those people were separated from the places they were working before it almost could have destroyed them if they were not men and women of faith and today persecution has the tendency to destroy people and disturb their social setup disturb their family setup disturb their physical setup and uh, the things that are material but he did the same thing in the early church yet because they were men and women of faith they did not allow what the enemies intended to come upon them in acts chapter 8 reading from verse 1 we're told that about the death of stephen saul was consenting unto his death and at that time there was a great persecution against the church with which was at jerusalem and they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of judea and samaria except the apostles persecution scattered them persecution made them to suffer persecution shifted them from their roots from where they were and you must understand that whenever there is persecution it's not easy for the people that are affected by persecution socially spiritually physically and in all other ways but then these believers did not deny the faith so we learn from them whatever persecution may arise and in whatever way that persecution may affect us affect our work affect our standing or promotion in the place of work affect our families affect us physically and materially it must not make us deny the faith instead of the persecution making them to deny the faith it made them to spread the gospel to stand more solidly on the gospel and uh, it did not bring about unnecessary questioning from their minds there are believers who are so affected by persecution that every day they question god but these people believed that god is on the throne and the persecutors will not be able to make them question God. They knew that whatever was happening, God was in control. And we must know today that whatever is happening, God is in control. As they were scattered abroad, we're told in verse 3. Acts 8 verse 3. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering in into every house and hailing men and women committed them to prison therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere doing what preaching the word preaching the word and whenever we are scattered abroad either because of persecution or because of our profession you are transferred away from where you are to another place or by education you go to study in another town anywhere you go whether it's by persecution education or profession there is only one thing to do to preach the word and this is what they did now as we come to acts chapter 11 verse 19 now they that were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about stephen traveled as far as phenicin as they traveled about as I've told you, they believed God. And they knew that God was in the know of everything that was going on. And they believed what Paul later wrote in Romans chapter 8, verse 28. We know that all things work together for good. To them that love God. To them who are called according to his purpose. All these people that were scattered instead of crying instead of mourning instead of denying the faith instead of challenging god instead of denying the faith instead of rolling up and saying well i will no more do anything about the lord i will no more uh, do anything about uh, speaking or preaching the gospel i'll no more do anything in the christian life they knew 
that all things work together for good. To them that love God. The only question they needed to ask was, did they love God? And if they loved God, they knew that all things eventually, ultimately, will work together for good. And if you are suffering persecution today, and that persecution has moved you out of a house to go and live in another community, or that persecution has moved you out of a place of work to go and work in another place, or that persecution has made you to be transferred from a place of work to another place of work, whatever effect that persecution might have had on you, you must know this, all things work together for good. To them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. In um, Romans chapter 11, verse 33, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. No doubt the persecutors themselves must have been surprised that what they intended to do, scatter the church, destroy the church, uproot the very foundations of the church, and wipe out, destroy the church, that was their intention. That's why they were persecuting the church. But they must have been, they must have been surprised how they couldn't destroy the church even in Jerusalem. But it spread to Judea and Samaria and even went to gentle land. That's the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. His judgments, his ways are unsearchable and past finding out. And so today too, we must realize and understand that all things that may happen to us in life can be used for the furtherance and the spreading of the gospel. It's been so from the beginning. And it is still so until this time. Come back to Acts chapter, 9, Acts chapter 11. Verse 9. Jesus says. Now, you may be talking to John aloud the gospel. That means I will stand like a preacher, either in the bus, one, be able to win souls. Now, there are soul winners. But there are those who go beyond being a soul winner. And they go into the ministry of being an evangelist. And the ministry of an evangelist is a ministry in the church, a gift in the church. Because the Bible says he gave some apostles, some prophets, and some evangelists. Not everybody will be evangelists. He gave some. He gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists. All should be soul winners. Everyone that has received the Lord ought to testify, ought to witness, ought to share the gospel. But only some will be evangelists. Now, to be an evangelist, a person must be part of the church. Because the ministry of the evangelist is a ministry that is going from the church and reaching out. In the New Testament, you have that word evangelist only three times. One in Acts of the Apostles, and it talks of Philip, who was a member of the church, within the church. In fact, a worker in the church, and later became an evangelist. And he still had a real connection with the church, because in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 8, when he ministered as an evangelist, the headquarters church in Jerusalem knew about it, and they sent in um, Peter and John. He was still in the church. And then you have another mention of the evangelist in uh, 1 Timothy, in 2 Timothy chapter 4. And uh, Paul was telling Timothy, do the work of an evangelist. And Timothy was a man of God in the church, not outside the church, in the church. Then you have um, in uh, Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11, he gave some apostles, where, where apostles developed in the church. Prophets, where they developed in the church, evangelists and pastors, where are pastors developed in the church, and teachers, where are they in the church? If the rest of the four are in the church, then that one evangelist is also in the church. And it's been sent out from the church to reach out, and then he comes back to the church to report back that the work he went to do this is what actually happened. So the soul winner preaches the word. The evangelist preaches the word. Now the missionary, the difference between the missionary and the evangelist is this. The evangelist um, is preaching the gospel. 
Now, if somebody goes from the Lagos church here and he goes to a town in, um, in Lagos stage and he preaches the gospel, if he's sent by the church, if the church knows about it and the church is supporting him by prayer, church supporting him in every moral way, spiritual way possible, that's an evangelist that, sent, that is sent from the church. But in another town within the same stage, or he's sent to another stage. But now when you send him away from his culture, you send him away from Nigeria, and you send him to an African country, he doesn't understand their language, he doesn't understand their, their culture, he doesn't understand anything about them, their style of life, their way of life is different. He's no more just a soul winner, he's no more just an ordinary evangelist, he's becoming a missionary. And he's establishing the work. He'll preach the gospel. People will come to the Lord. He will establish the people. He will plant a church there. He will develop workers. And then he will carry on that work in that other nation. Speaking a different language. In a different country. With a different culture. That is not just a soul winner. Not just an evangelist. He is now a missionary. And this is what happened with the early church. They were four soul winners. Then um, we're told of Philip, just an evangelist. But then we're told of these people in Acts 11, 19. They were scattered abroad. They left their culture. They left uh, Jerusalem. And they were now going into areas of uh, uh, Phoenicia, uh, Phoenicia and uh, Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word. But when they got there to none, but unto the Jews only. What does that mean? Now these uh, people were Jews but outside in another culture. And he found that when they got into those places, these Jews could understand them more and he started preaching unto them. Well, that's what you find almost even now. You find uh, some people who have gone away from Nigeria and they've gone to a place like France or to a place like um, London or to a place uh, like America and they begin to establish the world. It is easiest for them that because they are Nigerians who are the first set of people that will respond when they get to London, when they get to America, when they get to a part of Africa, the Nigerians um, who recognize them as Nigerians, who oh, they will say, uh, I understand that man. We came from the same area. And they will yield more to the gospel. And then from there, he will move on and he will speak to the people that are there. And uh, it was what happened at that time. And then in verse 20, And some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians, the Hellenist Jews, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them. And a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. These people were not apostles. They were not even prophets. Neither were they pastors. Neither were they established as teachers before they left Jerusalem. It was a persecution that scattered them. Neither had they attended even Bible school or seminary or any college. But because they had the Spirit of God within them and upon them and the Word of God in their hearts and they had the zeal to want to share the gospel and spread the gospel where they were scattered, we're told in verse 19, the hand of the Lord was with them. That's a language the hand of the Lord means the power of the Lord, the might of the Lord. The Lord supported them. And in Acts chapter 16 verse 20, we read, and they went forth and preached everywhere the Lord walking with them and confirming the word with signs following now it doesn't matter whether we're apostles or prophets evangelists or pastors or teachers if we're preaching the word if we're sharing the word as soul winners evangelists or missionaries the Lord will confirm the word if that is his word the hand of the Lord was with them the power of the Lord was with them. The might of the Lord was with them. And a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. But wait a moment. You see, why don't we see that today? We've heard of many people that went out. 
we are part of many people who have uh, gone out either from a uh, deeper life or from other churches and um, we do not see the hand of the Lord working with them and a great number believing and turning to the Lord at least we don't hear about that in that way what's happening well number one if you preach the word of the Lord the hand of the Lord will be with you if you preach the word of the Lord in its entirety without fear without favor without diluting it I'm telling you this because you know who knows the Lord may be preparing you to reach out as an evangelist tomorrow in another stage or as a missionary in another country and uh, as you go out understand that they preached the word and the Lord confirmed the word the Lord will not confirm personal opinions while you had been in the church here at the headquarters you'll be hearing the word of God and then eventually you are sent out maybe to another country or to another town and then uh, you say well uh, all the time I was at the, at the headquarters I didn't agree completely and fully with all my heart with that uh, message on restitution and sanctification and therefore now that I'm at liberty and uh, um, to preach uh, whatever I believe in this other country no more at the headquarters now I will preach whatever I like you know you'll preach whatever you like but the Holy Ghost will not confirm whatever you like the power of God will not come upon whatever you like and the might of God the supernatural power that normally follows the entire world will not confirm your own petty ideas and petty opinion but you know if you are sent out by the church sent out by the church and you are, you are in a particular place and the moment you get there you get on your knees and you say oh Lord here am I the general superintendent is not there my pastor is not here but then I'm sent out I'm going to be faithful to God faithful to the word of God I'm faithful to the commission that I've received I am going to preach the word now you see when you preach the word like that without fear without favor without modifying it without diluting it without saying well this is america let me be careful now this is britain let me be careful now don't let me talk about one man one wife there nobody will listen to me when you don't dilute the word of god it's only then the hand of the lord the power of the lord will be with you and will confirm that word miracles will happen the supernatural will take place but you know if you reach out and you go out and uh, you, you eventually say, well, I'll, be, I'll suck pedal. I will not preach this thing as it was preached before. That's why the world will not succeed. Do you understand that is why those who break away from a church, those who break away from a church that is preaching the full gospel, that's why it's difficult for them to succeed. Because before you can break away from a church like this, you have to be in disagreement with the teaching of the word of God. You won't break away until you disagree. Because a person that is going to break away must, you know, be discontent, discontented in their heart. He must say, well, I don't like that. I don't like this. I don't like that. And you can be sure, whatever he doesn't like, when he breaks away to establish another church, he is going to remove whatever he doesn't like. You know, all this waiting upon the Lord and praying to find the will of God in marriage, he doesn't like it. You know, all this uh, being obedient to leadership and obey those that are put over you in leadership, he doesn't like it. And you know, whatever he doesn't like, when he goes out to establish another church, another ministry, is going to remove the part of the world he doesn't like. And when he does that, what will happen? The Holy Ghost will not be able to back up and confirm the diluted preaching is given away. But you know, the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. And thank God today that um, wherever you are sent, wherever you are told to do things, if you'll just be faithful, preach the word of God, the Lord will confirm the word in Jesus' name. Amen. And a great number, a great number will turn to the Lord. Now you see, in a um, deeper life, we've sent uh, people out from this church and uh, the information we receive from various uh, states in, um, in Nigeria here if you have gone to your state before and you have checked up how about deeper life in your state you would have found out how the Lord is confirming that word 
how the hand of the Lord is with them. Even the people that went out just a few years ago, and you get to a particular state, I, no matter where in this country, and you find thousands, thousands, thousands. Last week, I, I went to the north, and I had not been in that place before, ever in my life. And I wanted to see deeper life there. And uh, I was wondering, uh, when I get out of the plane, how will I be able to locate this place? And as I was coming from the plane, uh, somebody saw me and said, Ah, bro, you are here? How about Thursday in Lagos? I said, don't worry, I'll be back in Lagos on Thursday. He said, uh, what have you come to do? I said, I come to see deeper life here. And as we were talking, the driver that came to pick him up, uh, you know, came and then we got into the car. And uh, that brother said, he's going to deeper life. He said, oh yes, I know this. I know deeper life. How can you be in this place and not, not know deeper life? I know it. And uh, took me right there. He didn't miss the road at all. And it doesn't matter where, far north or far south, anywhere you go. This work, the Lord has confirmed it with supernatural power. And we're hearing testimonies of wonderful miracles that are taking place. Why? Because the people that went out, they kept to the word of God. They kept to the word of God in small things and big things. And I'm telling you this, so that when you are sent out, who knows whether next week or next month or next year, if Jesus tarries, you'll be sent out. If you'll be faithful to the word you have been taught here, the hand of the Lord will be with you. And a great number will believe. And a great number will turn unto the Lord. That is a, that's the genesis of missions. That's how they went out. And that's how they were faithful to the preaching of the word. And as they were faithful, the Lord himself, he worked with them. Now, verse 22. Then tidings of these things came into the, unto the ears of the church, which was in Jerusalem. And they sent forth Barnabas that he should go as far as Antioch. And you recognize uh, there was great unity in the early church. Great unity in the early church. There was a great work going on in um, Phenice, Cyprus, Antioch, Cyrene. In all these various places, great work going on. Great numbers of people. It was easy for any of these people that were being used of God to eventually start... Um, Michael's Evangelistic Association. And you know, just divide the work, separate the work from the work in Jerusalem, from the headquarters. But no, they sent information to Jerusalem and they said, wonderful things are going on. Even though we came here by uh, being scattered by persecution, as we're preaching the word, the Lord is uh, confirming the work. And as the Lord is confirming the work, well, if you like, anytime you have chance, you can send anybody from the Jerusalem church. And eventually they sent uh, Barnabas. And uh, Barnabas, as he went over there, he saw the world. Now, we learn about Barnabas. He was a son of consolation. This was a consecrated man that sold all the earth. When um, we read about him in the, the early chapters of Acts of the Apostles, and he gave what he had to the work of the Lord at that time. And when Saul of Tarsus, who later became Paul, when he was converted and the Jerusalem church uh, could not receive him, it was this Barnabas that brought him to the apostles. And now, when they were looking for somebody who will go to, the, to, uh, to these places and get to Antioch, they found somebody. They said, Barnabas, always an encouragement to people. It's always uh, building up people. He never tears now. His consecration is to build up. His consecration is to just encourage people. And it's a son of consolation. Who can we send? Barnabas will be suitable. And look at uh, verse 24. For he was a good man, a kind man, a charitable man. A man that will comfort the weary, encourage those who are discouraged. A man that will exhort and uh, just build up the face of other people when they are going down. He was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith. A good man to his neighbors. Full of the Holy Ghost, his relationship to God. And then of faith, his heart was full of faith. No doubt with him at all. This was a man who believed all things are possible. 
He never had any negative idea. You never find negativism in his heart. Anytime you talk to him when he was in Jerusalem, praise the Lord, all things are possible. There is persecution. Will he not destroy the church? No, not possible. Because with God, all things are possible. The church is now undergoing a terrible time, a difficult time. What are we going to do with God? All things are possible. Now, uh, the church has no money. Yeah, will the church carry on the work? God will supply all our need with God. All things are possible. Uh, they just remembered him. When they heard about the work going on in Antioch, and they heard about many people that were coming to the Lord, and they said, who shall we send? Well, that man uh, who is always saying, with God all things are possible, he will be, he will be suitable. He never discourages anybody. He is always encouraging somebody. Always making someone to be excited in a positive way about good things. You know, when the church is to send out people, we look at the qualities in the lives of people. And if you want to be useful in the church, these are the qualities you'll develop in yourself. Be a good man, be a good woman, a positive man, a positive woman, and a man and a woman full of the Holy Ghost and a person of faith. And it says uh, in verse 23. Who when he came and had seen the grace of God was glad. This man, I told you, a positive man. When he got there, he saw the positive. He didn't see well. Uh, those who have been working here before, they didn't teach them all the doctrines properly. He now, the uh, supreme teacher has come. He's the only one who can do well. No, this man was a good man, full of the Holy Ghost and faith. He saw the grace of God in them and he was glad and he exhorted them that with purpose of heart they will cleave unto the Lord because he was a good man. Let me ask you, if we hear of the work spreading in uh, African countries, in the Republic of Benin, in uh, Cameroon, in Togo, in Ivory Coast, in Burkina Faso, in Kenya, in Zambia, in Zimbabwe, and in all these other parts of Africa where we have sent uh, people now and we just say we're looking for people can we send you are you a good man are you a good woman a positive man a positive woman are you a man and a woman or a woman full of the Holy Ghost are you full of faith or will you be wondering if I get there what will I eat if I get there, how will it look for me? You know, missionaries don't think like that. Missionaries don't think about difficulties. Missionaries don't think about a scarcity of, a, of a material things and lack of money, lack of funds. There are people who, are, who have addicted themselves into the, onto the work of the Lord. And then it says in verse 25, Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul. What does that mean? Barnabas got to that place. And he had some gifts in his life. And already he was exhorting the people, encouraging them. And already we are told in verse 24, much people was added unto the Lord. After Barnabas came, a great evangelist and missionary. And then he remembered there is a teacher, a teacher of the world. Who can just stand like this? Not jump up and down, move anywhere, and just lay line upon line, precept upon precept, and prove from Genesis to Malachi that that Jesus is the Christ. He remembered him. And he said, where will he be now? And he sought for him until he found him in, um, in Tarsus. But you know, this man had a good attitude. He didn't say, well, as a, I'm a great man of a great gift here in Antioch. If I go to call him Saul, he may overshadow me. No, he wasn't a proud man. He wanted Saul to come and share in the ministry, in the ministry of teaching. And therefore he sought for him. And in verse 26, and when they had found him, they, when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church. Actually, the Greek says, in the church and taught much people. The people were many. What do you do in a growing church? Entertain the people? What do you do in a growing church? Uh, give them picnics and uh, ceremonies? In a growing church, what you do is you teach the people. That's the work of the church. Whether it's a small church or a large church, you teach the church. And that is why this church is committed to teaching. 
We're not committed to fun fair, to entertainment. We're not committed to eating and drinking. We're not committed to just uh, programs to make uh, the, a youth uh, happy, a youth wing of the church, oh, so that they have cinema, they have a lot of programs to make them happy. No, the church is committed to teaching. And when Barnabas had seen Saul and he came to the church, they knew that as these people were many and they were multiplying, there's something they must be committed to, and that is teaching the people. They taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. They taught them so much that everybody that saw them everywhere, they were saying, they look like Christ. They look like Christ. They look like Christ. Christians. How about you? Do you look like Christ so much that people around you will just recognize? That's a Christian. That's a Christian. That's a Christian. By your life. By your conduct. In Antioch, they saw the people and he called them Christians. Now, if you're going to be a person that will be used of God like that, one, you ought to be a Christian. Two, you ought to have some gifts in your life. Like we have seen in the life of Barnabas. One, he was a good man. Gentle man. He was a kind man, a charitable man, a man of love. Two, a man full of the Holy Ghost. If you're going to get any work done, instead of being in a hurry and say, well, I've been in this church for a long time and uh, the church has not sent me out as a great evangelist, as a missionary, just uh, be patient and go on your knees and become full of the Holy Ghost. Uh, you know, it's not consecration. I've yielded my life to the Lord. Oh, yes, if you yield an empty vessel to the Lord, that empty vessel, even though it's a yielded vessel, as long as the yielded vessel is an empty vessel, it cannot be sent out. Be full of the Holy Ghost. I've been in the church since uh, 19 such and such. I've spent more than seven years in the church now. That's history. That's storytelling. It is not how many years you have spent in the church. It is, are you a good man? Are you a good woman? Are you full of the Holy Ghost? And then full of faith. On what level is your faith? Is your faith able to heal the sick? If your faith able to cast out devils? If your faith is your faith able to work wonders and miracles, are you a man full of the Holy Ghost and full of faith? And are you a good man that will go out and encourage people? But you know, a person that is in the church and murmuring and grumbling and complaining and doesn't have time to develop as a good man, as a man full of the Holy Ghost, and as a man full of faith, a man like that will never, 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 never become an evangelist or a missionary, a great a worker sent out to go and do a great work. But you know, if you just, uh, if you don't complain, if you don't go about just murmuring, but you just uh, stay on, you're filling up yourself, filling up yourself with the Holy Ghost, being yielding to the Holy Ghost and full of faith. Now, what other qualities? Because we've seen in the life of this uh, man Barnabas, we've seen the qualities and the gifts. In Romans chapter 12, from verse 4, for as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given unto us. Having then gifts. What gifts have you got? Don't just make supposition. Talk in reality. What gifts have you got? Don't just say, well, I know if I'm given the chance, I can do a lot. That's opposition. What gifts have you got? You know, if you're going to really do a work like you are thinking about, and like we're teaching about tonight, to really evangelize in large scale, and do a missionary work in a large scale, there must be gifts in your life. I'm not just talking of the gifts of the Spirit which I've read about before in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I'm talking about gifts to minister. Now, when you talk, do people understand you? Are you coherent in your uh, giving a message? Are you able to build up a message? That's a gift. Are you able to teach and lay line upon line? That's a gift. Do you have recollective memory? That when you're preaching the word of God, you remember, oh yes, that verse is there, and refer to it, oh yes, that passage is there. Do you have the ability to interpret the word of God, rightly divided, without a misleading people? That's a gift, and it's a gift you develop. 
Are you able to encourage? Do you know where the verses are? Verses of comfort. Verses of encouragement to those who are down, those who are discouraged in their lives. That's a gift. And you must develop all these gifts. The gift of teaching. The gift of preaching. And the gift of drawing people to the fold and to the Lord. And then when there are problems in a particular church, do you have that gift to remain cool-headed and stand as a pillar in the church of God and coordinate that church together? Do you have that? That's a gift. And you know, if you're going to do a work like we are talking about tonight, these gifts are necessary. Do you have uh, the creativity? You know, uh, that, is, uh, that means uh, you get to a place and you ask yourself, what am I going to do? Do you have the creativity, the understanding that, well, uh, this will be done, this will be done, listening to the Holy Ghost that if this is done, if this is done, it will bring people into the fold and you'll still be in line with the scriptures? That's a gift. And it says, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith, or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity, he that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. And so you can see that if we're going to actually get this work done like this, it is going to take gifts given by the Lord. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. And he gave some apostles. You can't claim it. You know people that say, now I'm going to the Lord. I'm going to claim an office in the church. Which one will I claim? The biggest. I claim an apostle. I believe it. Let nobody bring doubt in my heart. I'm an apostle. Now that doesn't make you an apostle. He gave some. You must discover which one he has given you. And minister in the realm in which he has given you. It's not by copying people. Or some he gave as prophets. And some he gave as evangelists. And some he gave as pastors. And some he gave as teachers. It's a gift. Now, the gift must be there. And when the gift is there, the gift will make room for the man. In Proverbs chapter 16. Chapter 18, rather. Proverbs chapter 18. Verse 16. A man's gift maketh room for him. And bringeth him before great men. What a man has, the qualities that a man has, will bring him before great men. He will do the work. And if those gifts are given by the Holy Ghost, and you use those gifts according to the precepts of the Word of God, the hand of the Lord will be with you. And much people will be added unto the Lord. Now let's come back to Acts chapter 11. My brother, my sister, why do we teach all these things? We teach all these things so that everyone will be able to discover at what level he is today. So that whatever the Lord wants any one of us to do in the future, we'll be able to do it according to the word of God, in unity with the church of God. And now in verse 27, generosity of members. You know what makes us to understand whether the work is a, an established work or not, the attitude of those people you are gathering together. And uh, my brother, my sister, think about it. Think about it. Now, your teaching, your preaching will have an effect upon people. And if you have been teaching hatred, those members will manifest hatred. If you have been teaching segregationalism, those members will um, manifest a separatist attitude. But you know, in deeper life, anywhere I go, some of those people might never have seen me before. But because the leaders over there, they have been teaching the people in the right way, in the right way, whenever they hear that the leader is coming from the headquarters in Lagos, those people are so very happy so very happy and um, it shows the effect of the teaching they've been giving the people there and it's the same thing with our pastors our preachers that were sent out they, what have you come for why didn't you write to us before you came 
We're sorry, we cannot receive you into this. This is our church. We established it. We built it. And therefore, we cannot just accept any worker from the headquarters. You know, that would be a wrong attitude, a destructive attitude, a dangerous attitude in the church. But you know, they've been teaching those people well. Last um, week, we sent uh, some people from here to Ibadan because um, you don't know what is going on. We are planning a crusade for Ibadan like we did um, for Lagos. And uh, it's the headquarters here that is planning that crusade. And we sent a team from here, from Lagos here to Ibadan. And uh, when we sent uh, that team, they met them right in their fellowship. I wasn't with them. I had gone to the north and uh, they went to Ibadan here. But you know, when they got there, the leader there introduced the people. And all those people were so very happy to receive uh, this team from Lagos, from the headquarters. That's a real church. But the church where we send a team from Lagos, and uh, that pastor there will see that that team has come from Lagos, and then he will say, ah, they want to come and talk to my church. And then he, he continues talking and talking and talking until 9.30. And then uh, after 9.30, uh, he announces to the people, well, they have sent some people from Lagos, from the headquarters, but it's 9.30 already, and uh, we are sorry that... Uh, uh, you cannot see them today. It is too late. If we delay you, you will not be able to get transportation. And uh, therefore, goodbye. I'll greet them for you. And I will send. Uh, I will say that you love them. Don't you love them? Yes, we love them. Okay, good night. God bless you. And then uh, this pastor, in a mischievous way, will tell the team from Lagos, oh, those people, oh, they really love you. Only that they don't want to see your face. But they, they really love you. You know, a church like that, will be a church where you have not taught the people right. But when these people, when they arrived from um, Jerusalem, they received them. And then in verse 28, there stood up one of them, named Dagabos, and signified by the Spirit that there should be great deals of famine throughout all the world, which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples, every man, according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which, that dwelt, uh, which dwelt in Judea. Which also they did, and sent it by the elders, by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. That church, they had generosity. And the generosity of the members shows us how the people have been taught. I'm teaching you this so that you will understand. If tomorrow you are sent out from this church to go and do a missionary work, evangelistic work, anywhere... You will understand that you ought to teach the members the word of God. The word of God to the point that whenever other workers are sent from Lagos to come to look at uh, the work going on in that location, those members will identify. They'll know, oh yes, it's the same church. It's the same church. That's how they did it in the New Testament. And when uh, Agabus stood up and said of a famine that was coming to um, hit the world at that time, they decided we're going to help the church in Judea. And uh, when they collected the material things together, they gave Barnabas and Saul. You know, Saul was humble. Barnabas was humble. Good man, full of the Holy Ghost and of faith. And now material things were collected. And they were wondering, who will carry these material things and take everything to Judea? And the church decided, uh, we'll send Barnabas, we'll send Saul. You know, they could have said, what do you mean? We are real preachers, real evangelists, and uh, we are real workers in the church. No, we can't do it. Zonad leader, you learn anything from this? That when there is physical work to be done, work relating to material things, not preaching, not counseling, not healing the sick, yet the zonal leader is to stoop down in humility and get that work done. And the village pastor, if you are there, you know, we call you and we say, now, uh, let's do this work and you are going to carry this food. You follow this vehicle and carry the food to IBTC. Ah, I'm a pastor uh, of a local church in Deeper Life. Can't you find other people who can do that? Uh, since I'm a pastor, let's learn from Saul. 
Let's learn from Barnabas. This is how the church was built up in the early days. Let's keep to the pattern. Let's all remain humble. And whatever you are instructed to do by the church, do it with all your heart. The members were generous. The missionaries were gifted. And then as the missions work started, it was carried on in such a way that the hand of the Lord was with them. I pray that what we have learned today will be beneficial to us, not only today, but in the future, in whatever the Lord will tell us to do. And if you want to be used of the Lord, remember there must be the gifts in your life, which I've talked about. You go to the Lord in prayer and say, Oh God, I know that at present I don't have this, but give it to me. I want these gifts in my life. Rise up and let us pray. A man that will be used of God will not be a man that is causing confusion and division. But a man that will link the work, whatever is being done, to the church at the headquarters. And will preach the whole world. And the Lord will work with such a person. Work with such a person.